Ron Counts and Scott Wanninger of the KGS office in Henderson, Kentucky, demonstrated some of their sediment coring and logging capabilities when they were at the KGS Well Sample and Core Library in Lexington. The in, in, internal logger takes a while, so you drill the depth and then we can set uh, we can set up uh, PVC to game log, or we even have a uh, bit brought it over here. While we auger, we can do a direct push, so we can put this in the top and we can push a core barrel while we're augering and pull out an inner core. So this has a swivel, so while you're while you're rotating, this this stays straight, so you're not spinning your core, you're just pushing the core straight in the ground. But that takes a lot of time, and um, we bought this originally to gamma log, and that's our gamma logger over there, and you need casing to gamma log. Uh, but we also have uh, these, we have 50 feet of these, we have 160 feet of these. These are three and a quarter solid stem augers. So these are good for bringing up cuttings if you're, if you're uh, it takes time to core. Sometimes you just want cuttings. You don't need a, a really good continuous core. You can auger to depth with these. And we, the deep, this is the deepest we've done, 112 feet. We hit bedrock. We could have gone more, but we just hit bedrock. And we was pulling up a really thick clay. Um, these are really good. These are two inch, not two inch anymore. Uh, we have about 120 feet of this, and these are really good for quick soundings. If you just want to know where bedrock is, we can shoot these down at the ground almost as fast as you can add them. And you can just, once you hit refusal, you know where bedrock is. They don't pull up very good cuttings, though. They're really small fins. These are good for getting the cuttings. This is a two and a half inch core barrel, and we have several cutting bits for harder hard pans. This one was used in a gravel, so it's kind of uh, worn out now. Um, we don't rotate too much. What we really like to do with the getting is direct push. And that way there you get relatively undisturbed continuous core. Um, the core barrel for it is inside here. So this is one up. This is kind of what they look like. This isn't the drive head though. So we just put a plastic liner in, you drive it down to your depth, you pull it back out, you pull out your liner, you have your core. What we just got last year um, was this dual tubing. And so what we can do with this or, or let me back up. So one problem with, with pouring dire directly like this, if you hit a saturated layer or a silt, sometimes it heaves in on your borehole, and then you go to pour again, you're pouring the same interval repeatedly. And so you need a way to, to get through that. And so this dual tubing is really good for that because what happens is we can drive this outer rod and the inner rod at the same time, and then um, we pull the inner rod out, we leave this in the ground, you thread another one on, and so you're driving casing as you collect the pour at the same time. So you're keeping your borehole con continuously cased as you pour. And the other thing, I had this custom made on the end to keep the borehole open a little bit larger than this so you don't get all the friction so you can go deeper. And then I had this pit point made. Um, we can auger with these to get cuttings and then if we want a gamma log, instead of shooting these things, these big things, they're heavy, um, we can just drive this straight into the ground. We only have nine meters and then we can gamma log through the steel and it pulls up really easy. So this is really nice. And I only bought nine meters because I wasn't sure if the rig could push it, but it's doing it just fine. It does nine meters, no problem. But this dual tube doesn't work very well if you get sand. If you get into some saturated sand, you get a little bit of sand in between the two, it binds up and you're done. And so what I did was I kind of took off uh, what uh, they do in lake coring with pistons because the muds are so so soft when you core in a lake, the, the hole just heaves back in. So we made a, I made a piston. And this is kind of what it looks like. And so what we do is you get to a depth where you need the piston, and usually we just start with it after the first one. This is what it looks like. And so you're basically driving a solid rod into the ground until you get to the interval you want. And on the, on the gettings is a winch where you hook this cable and you pull it really tight and then you drill. And what happens is this, this piston stays put um, in place while you're drilling the casing or the liner past it. And it actually acts like a syringe and it sucks the, the sediment into the core. I've actually gotten a pebble sand, three meters of pebble sand like this. Usually when you try to push on any sand, um, you're done. It's hard to direct push the sand. You have to rotate it. But this creates a suction and it actually sucks the sand into the core barrel. It works really well. The trick is not to tighten this too tight because you'll pull your, uh, you'll snap your cable. If you don't do it tight enough, if you hit um, where your sand heaves in, it'll start pushing the, the core in. So this one isn't tight. And that's what will happen. And you can tell when you're going down, all of a sudden your cable will start to get slack. You'll know your piston's riding up. And so what I do is, that happens sometimes, but usually it only rides up about a foot. So you just know where it is and then you know you measure how much it rode up, then you go ahead and core it, and you know the top foot is is slot from the previous interval. The so the tube is, is strong enough to push through. The way it's in, it's actually inside this. Uh, so this okay. this is what is inside here. Gotcha. This gotcha. Is this is what's inside here. Yeah, this is gotcha. what it looks like on the inside. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. 
Yeah, they do, for, for lake pouring, they make polyacrylic tubes like this, they just push the tubes. Right? They're, they're through the mud, it, it does it, they're really strong. These are weak, you can just cut these with a, with a little razor knife. Um, but the, the problem is, this takes up space, right? So this is a five, five foot or one and a half meters, but I can only drive 1.25 meters or about four feet. So what I did recently, I had this custom made, and this is almost six feet, and so if I have to order um, these liners now at this length, and then I can get a full one and a half meters per drive. So it, the piston will take up the space in the top. And so it's just, it cuts down on your time. The, the fewer times you have to go on the ground, the more continuous your core is. You don't have to worry about overlaps or, or slop in the middle. So I, 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 like, I like doing it. When you, when you rotate the augers, the augers are connected together. They're hex heads, and so they're solid. Um, these bars, the, the, the sol they come in solid and hollow. And so remember the cutting head, the, the core barrel with the cutting head? If you rotate with that, you have bars on the end. If you go down to depth, you need to have all solid bars. If you go down to depth, you need to have all solid bars. I learned that the hard way. I snapped one of these in half um, on a sandstone. I didn't know I was on the sandstone yet. So we only have two solid bars. So when I do that now, 20 feet's the limit. If you're going to pour like that, 20 feet, because we only have eight, 16. These are 8 feet each. We have 16 feet plus the 4-foot barrel. So we can only go 20 feet. So I, we, earlier we set this up, so all we do is we hook this bar into these anchors and you shoot, rotate them into the ground. And that's why I'm kind of concerned. I've never had an anchor not go all the way down. Here they didn't go very down, so I think I hit a rock, something in the regolith, or I hit bedrock, I don't know. Bedrock was almost five feet over there. We'll see. Um, um, you going to drill? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put, put one in real quick. All right. I got a four foot barrel on right now, so we'll see if it can make can it. I see your permit? <laughs> it's, um, I filed it at the office. I'll email it to you. Alright. It's uh, continuous, it's undisturbed. Would you say uh, Royal Springs ran? Oh, yeah. They were right on line with Royal Springs right here. Is that right? Oh, yeah. So there's your core. And this is right, this is what's sitting right on top of bedrock. India Thicknia, this has been bioturbated with earthworms. <laughs> this is earthworm bioturbation right here, that's classic. Uh, Top bottom, yep. Yeah. So see this, this is your organic, more organic rich 10YR4 free color. You start to get redox, redoxomorphic Pardon me. iron concretions. Sorry. No, no, Black yeah. is manganese, so there's water tables perched right here for, on something, and then the clay picks up right in here, it's really dense. And this rubbly zone, um, this is a See, it looks pelletized. Yeah, that, that's called Ediapicnia. That's earthworms. It is. That's uh, is this a rock here? Uh, right, right. Place? Yeah, um, right here. Yeah, we get we. So the worms refusal. are that far down? They're sitting on the bedrock, and right now it's dry. It's completely dry right now. Mm -hmm. So, that's that's what that is. No doubt in my mind. See all the see all the little knobby pellets. Oh, yeah. They look like pellets. Excretion. Yeah. Excretion. <laughs> Ediapicnia. <laughs> Ron, give me a could be old. What are you going to do with this? Uh, a sedimentologist from the Indiana Survey taught me that. Yeah. 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 Quality. Oh, yeah. You can see it Great. in uh, rock, too. You can see an actual rock. So do you think this was disturbed by the construction of the building? Um, it was just, uh, buried a little deeper. It looked like you may have excavated just the top, a just little. The, just the top foot. Um, we can see the, the ridge. It looked like there might have been another organic zone down here. This where has where a... There was maybe a this has pretty good structure right here. Subangular block. So if they can disturb this, uh, mm -hmm. they disturb this with construction. This this wouldn't show such good structure after just 15 or 20 years. Yeah, pretty dense. Yeah, it's real dense. It breaks where it wants to, not where you want it to. So it's got soil development.
The Henderson office staff also demonstrated this gamma logger using a well drilled on the core library property. This is the depth of the, the, the probe. And actually, we've got it set for the actual sense of the, the little gamma source. So that's where it's measuring. That's the depth of the measuring device. The probe's almost three feet long. And then this is the rate of five feet per minute, 4.9 to five feet. That's how fast we're pulling it up. It'll, it'll do a maximum of uh, 80 feet. And it'll go as slow as 0.1 feet. And so for bedrock, I mean, I don't know that we need to go this slow. But for unconsolidated sediment, that's how fast we go because there's actually, it's been shown through various research articles that you can actually see sequences in the, in the sediment if you log it with a gamma logger, natural gamma, at five feet per minute. And so that's kind of how we do it. Here is a real-time readout of the gamma rays per second versus depth of the gamma logger as the logging tool is drawn back up the well at the core library. The gamma logger transmitting this information is reading the gamma decay from naturally occurring radioisotopes such as potassium-40 in the soil or rock. 